we are, if we're not the largest MGA in the space, we are in the top three. Uh, so we, we will end this year a little over $4 billion. You're listening to Beyond the Claim, the show for forward-thinking risk and claims professionals curious about the latest industry trends, winning strategies, and stories from influential leaders. Let's dive in. Today I have with me Brad Isaacson from Minta Group. Uh, Brad, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it quite a bit. So uh, full disclosure to the audience, you know, Brad has been uh, completely helpful and accessible um, in Broadfire's um, uh, journey to um, expand ourselves in the the uh, MGA and alternative market space. So wonderful to to have him aboard here. But you know, as we were organizing this conversation, Brad, um, I I found my I found myself in a place where I, I'm sure that there are many out there that uh, one uh, are still getting comfortable with the you know captive program. Uh, risk retention space, and then two, uh, knowing as large and as diverse as a Minta group is, possibly not knowing a Minta. So I figured in the opening we could take a step back and maybe you could help inform the audience more broadly on uh, the space in general, and then um, more specifically a Minta group. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, so a little bit about uh, a Minta. We actually came out of a uh, an insurance carrier uh, by the by the name of Amtrust. So. Uh, when uh, when Amtrust was was uh, going private, um, one of the uh, ways they looked at raising capital was to spin off their what they called their fee business, uh, which was their aggregation of third party MGAs. So long story short, they they did that um, private equity uh, by the name of Madison Dearborn Partners uh, bought a controlling interest. Uh, and that is a Minta today. So that was about that was about four or five years ago. Um, and fast forward to today, we are, if we're not the largest MGA in the space, we are in the top three. Uh, so we, we will end this year a little over four billion in controlled premiums. Uh, and uh, uh, we're constantly adding, uh, new entities. We're very active in the uh, in the M and A space. Uh, we uh, actually, Mark. I don't know if you saw this, but there was a press release today that we finalized the acquisition of Ambridge. So that is a congratulations. That is a large MGA. That will actually be our largest internal business. That's a, a roughly seven hundred million dollar in premium acquisition. Uh, a little over four hundred we paid. Um, and they are in the, in the transactional, uh, space, uh, they've been, uh, writing, uh, reps and warranties, contingency and tax, uh, uh, pretty much longer than anybody in, in the, in the industry. So, um, you know, and it's a perfect fit for us in that, uh, we're always looking for industry leaders and uh, outfits and individuals that are known in their space. And of course, Ambridge certainly is. So um, uh, congratulations. Put I that mean, in there. Uh, certainly excited yeah, no, to have I, them part look, of uh, part of Aminta. That's a great addition to Aminta um, and but, also uh, great to uh, see that you're in a position to add them. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so uh, so Aminta, um, as I mentioned, one of the largest MGAs in the US. Um, we. Uh, we will end uh, end the year over four billion in premium. Uh, three segments of business really comprise Aminta. We have a large warranty space, so anything that you can think of that uh, uh, is sold with a warranty, uh, we sell. Uh, so a large portion of that's in the auto industry, OEMs, and and, and the like. Uh, uh, we have a large consumer warranty uh, business uh, as as well. Uh, so that's. That's roughly 700 million of our premium. Uh, we have a large specialty risk operation. You mentioned captives and risk retention groups. Uh, we own risk services down in, in uh, Sarasota. It's headed by an individual by the name of Mike Rogers and anybody in the alternative market space knows Mike. Uh, so he's um, he's uh, he's been doing that his, uh, his entire career. And they are, uh, if they're not the largest captive manager in the US, they're in the top two or three. Um, so, uh, so that's, that's our specialty risk. 
Uh, and then we have our traditional uh, MGA space. So we have about 20 MGAs across the US writing anything from contractors to micro business to uh, aviation, um, you know, a wide variety of, of specialty niche classes of business. Uh, we're constantly looking for uh, new acquisitions, either from a organizational perspective, uh, for uh, we're looking for talent in, in the industry that individual or a team that may want to uh, take their particular um, underwriting and, and distribution and, and process knowledge and uh, develop their own deal. So we've done a number of those. Uh, and we've also done, uh, been very successful in what we call uh, carrier carve outs. So it could be a carrier that is looking to divest themselves of a particular niche, could be, you know, workers comp or professional liability or specific program that they either can't make profitable or just can't get it up to critical mass. Um, and they'll carve that out and sell that to us. Uh, and then we, we uh, could get a capacity commitment from that carrier, um, or we'll move that to one of our uh, strategic uh, partners. So uh, certainly an interesting time uh, to be at Amenta. And Brad, I wanna talk about some of the areas of uh, specialization, but this is, and I will come back to that. Um, before we go too far, uh, this is a, you know, not something that you typically see as a, a career path or journey or that you hear in the media quite often, but there, it's, a, it's a significant space that supports uh, many of our businesses and industries. Um, how did you uh, personally come into this space? So uh, I got into insurance. Um, my, uh, uh, my parents were in insurance. And uh, I said that growing up, I would do anything but insurance. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, but uh, no, I, uh, I graduated, got a job with, uh, uh, with Liberty Mutual and started in there. Uh, this is in the late 80s. So I've been doing this a while, Mark, but uh, started in their large risk um, uh, uh, division. And uh, it was good training ground back in the back in the day, and uh, after about three years there, I was looking at making a change, and I just happened to stumble uh, across a company by the name of Firearms Fund, who back in the day was a program expert. And this is this is you know uh, late '80s, early '90s when programs weren't really a thing. So um, you know we uh, Firearms Fund had a division by the name of Famex. F-A-M-E-X, and it was basic, basically a, their model was to um, uh, get national association endorsements. So it could be national uh, tire and wheel, uh, a van line uh, company or association, and they would partner with that association, build product for that association, and then distribute it through an exclusive network of independent agents. So that was kind of a unique model back in the day. Not a whole lot of carriers, uh, like I said, were in the program space. Um, so it was Fireman's Fund. CNA had what they called their CAM programs uh, uh, back in the day. Uh, so that's where I got my start in programs uh, as, uh, as an underwriter. Uh, over the years, uh, their model evolved, and I moved my way up through the organization. My last job there was... Uh, uh, as a uh, uh, the Southeast um, uh, VP of programs and left there in 2005 and went to a small specialty company uh, by the name of American Safety uh, to run their program and alternative risk uh, division. Spent nine years there, went to another carrier by the name of AIX, which was part of the Hanover. Uh, and I was regional president. Uh, AIX was the program company uh, for Hanover, still is. Um, and uh, uh, I left there three years ago to come to Amenta. So long track record in the program space, been doing programs for over 30 years. I've probably put together um, uh, over 100 programs uh, in, uh, in my career. And uh, I've always been on the, the balance sheet or the P&L side of the house. And now I'm on the, on the uh, distribution and, and uh, uh, 
uh, MGA side of the house. So it's, it's a unique perspective, but it's the, it's the, it's the same business. I appreciate that. You know, part of our, our mission here is to help plant the seeds and, you know, lay the breadcrumbs for, you know, the, the future generations that will help to bring this uh, space forward. And, you know, that want to bring more awareness wherever possible. Um, but going back to, you know, the, your points on uh, Mensa, and the you know the intentional obviously m a activity and then broader growth um uh, mission uh, it, it seems that aminta is, is very confident and intentional about bringing in as you mentioned uh best in class and industry leader and programs but not necessarily rebranding them uh into aminta right and so uh, it, can you speak to that and, and is there is there a reason behind that there is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually one of our selling, po uh, selling points when we're out looking for talent and looking for new acquisitions. Uh, so uh, we buy entities and we bring on people for a reason. Um, and in many cases, uh, like Ambridge, in many cases, they are leaders of their particular uh, segment of business. And there's a lot of brand uh, awareness around their own brand. So we typically, on an established uh, uh, MGA, uh, we tend not to rebrand them to amend it. Now, um, you know, if you've gone through uh, our website and you see what we call our wheel, which is our, our uh, listing of all of our MGAs, you will see some Aminta branded businesses within that. Uh, a majority of those are teams that we've brought on board, not entities that we've, uh, that we've, that we've bought. So that's our overall philosophy of that. Uh, some of our competitors don't have that philosophy. They'll buy somebody in, in one day and then in the next day, um, they're out changing the signs on the front of the building, right? Um, we, don't, we don't have that philosophy. You know, we, uh, uh, like I said, we, we're, we're buying uh, top tier organizations, top tier talent to bring them on board. We let them continue to do business um, uh, as they see fit. And we're here as an organization to support them where they need support. It could be a new capacity or uh, helping them set up a new, uh, a new program. Uh, but uh, again, it's their business, uh, their business to run. So yeah, uh, in that, down that same vein, Aminta covers a, a broad spectrum of industries, a uh, broad spectrum of specific programs. But would you say that there is a a, a target uh, profile for um, your your clients or customers that you feel you're best suited to fit? Maybe not by industry or 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 program, but maybe by you know where they are in their corporate journey or what they're looking to achieve from a, a risk control perspective. Or are you are you open to any and all? We we are we're we're fairly open. Uh, to any and all, to be honest with you. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it tends to be more the decision of, of the seller, not the buyer, right? Um, uh, we, we certainly are looking, like I said before, we're looking for individuals, teams, uh, talent, businesses that are uh, top tier in their business. So if you ask what we're looking for, we're certainly looking for that. Uh, we do some bolt-ons, so it could be an existing business that we're currently in, and we see an organization that would fit and fold neatly into that. We'll, we've done some of that, um, but um, again, it, it, uh, we're, we're looking more for the opportunity to partner with a leader in, 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 in whatever business they're in um, uh, to bring into to, uh, to a momentum. And how do you view, uh, you know, hardening market? Um, are you seeing that that is influencing the space one way or another, uh, or is it has it been business as usual for the most part? Well, it's uh, well, we're certainly seeing hardening in certain areas, and some certain areas we're not. Uh, so uh, we do a, a good amount of workers' compensation business. That is still fairly soft, although we're starting to see some signs of, of, of uh, small turning there. But you know, we've seen rate decreases in the, in the workers' comp line for the past, what, four or five years now. 
uh, but it continues to be a uh, profitable segment of the, of the business um, uh, as a, from an indus industry perspective. Uh, so, uh, so that line is, is, uh, is still somewhat soft. We have seen hardening in, in other areas and, and uh, some you see a little bit and some areas are, uh, have been uh, uh, hard, hardening significantly. So uh, some of the excess liability lines, certainly auto has been a, a line of business that has been, uh, you know, from a pricing perspective, um, has been hardening for the past, you know, four or five years. Um, so, you know, it's really, it's really a more of a line of business uh, specific thing or a class of business specific uh, issue. So uh, we do quite a bit in the aviation space and uh, we entered, um, uh, we brought an individual on board about a year and a half ago to build out hull and liability around our aviation business. And that's a lot, that is a segment of business that hardened significantly overnight. So it had softened and softened and softened. Uh, and then almost overnight capacity left rates went through the roof and we saw a significant opportunity to, to enter the space at that point. When you, uh, so when you're looking at either programs from an M&A standpoint, or you go directly to the ultimate consumer uh, and you and you're looking to represent a Minta. Are there any, you know, examples of success stories where you say, "Hey, this is where we've had a an example of the the impact that we're having on our clients, uh, you know, directly or indirectly via one of our programs that you say really captures or encapsulates the uh, Minta uh, group mission or vision." Yeah. So, uh, but, but Mark, if I give you an example, all the other business units are going to get upset. So, uh, um, there. But, uh, yeah, no, uh, you know, uh, uh, one that comes to mind, um, in all seriousness is, uh, we own uh, BTIS. It stands for builders, trade insurance services. Uh, and they're, uh, up until the, the average acquisition, our largest business unit, they're over 400 million in premium, um, started 25 plus years ago by uh, the two individuals that run it are, are brothers, Paul and Hank Albine, um, that run BTIS. Their father started the business. And he came up with the idea, and this is, you gotta remember, this is 25, 30 years ago uh, when no one was talking this way. Um, uh, his overall philosophy, he was a retail agent. His overall philosophy was, look, the transaction between the agent and the company or the agent and the MGA is too difficult. We need to streamline that. We need to make it easier, especially on small business. So um, he created, uh, brought some talent on board. They actually built out a rate quote find issue system, again, 25 years ago, uh, with APIs directly into carrier feeds. So. Uh, when they sign up in a, uh, uh, an individual retail partner, that retail partner goes on their website. It's an insurance marketplace. It's got all their products listed. Uh, agent can go in and, uh, okay, I need a professional liability quote. I need a small business quote. I need a small workers comp quote. Uh, they put in, uh, fill out the series of questions, the application for that particular entity. It feeds different companies and comes back with a number of quotes and they can select the one that, that best suits their needs. Uh, so use of technology, um, uh, they have created niches or programs where they can really uh, drive value uh, to the end client. Uh, and it is a marketing machine. They have, four, like I said, $400 million of business with 40,000 retail agents across the US uh, and heavy West Coast presence and a tremendous opportunity to continue to grow and expand um, uh, geographically and, uh, and product wise. Uh, so um, it's basically an insure tech type platform and business before anybody was even talking about insure tech. I would say many aren't there still today, Brad, quite honestly. I mean, that you're, we're still talking that type yeah. of interface mm -hmm. as, a, as yeah. an emerging technology for many. So yeah, that's, that is impressive. I will definitely, and, and if nothing else, we've, we've raised the bar for the, the other business to know what you are looking for to, as a success story. So good, good stuff there. Um, I will, so great. last question. Yeah, exactly. They're all great. All great. All great. Uh, <laughs> last question for you. So um, when you look at the, the market, 
uh, are there any emerging trends or developments, you know, in the field from a, a program standpoint um, that you're really focused on, um, either for opportunity or a point of risk um, that you feel, you know, are are going to impact the space for the, the near future? Yeah, I think. Well, you're seeing it. So, um, you know, the the uh, the program marketplace is growing double the insurance marketplace. So you're seeing um, more capacity, more players in our space. Um, you know, there's just a tremendous uh, amount of opportunities. So, um, you know, capacity has, has, uh, uh, has entered program business at a, at a, a exponential rate. Uh, in a number of different vehicles. So, um, and I think the most notable is, is uh, fronting or hybrid carriers. And by that, I mean that, that you've got these non-traditional insurance companies that have come in, uh, they provide the capacity, they provide the regulatory and, and filing support necessary to, to be successful in the business, take a minimal amount of risk, and then there's reinsurance, reinsurance support uh, behind it. So, you know, 10 years ago, there were one or two carriers kind of doing that and in that space. And today there's uh, 30 plus. So there's been a tremendous influx and as a result, increased capacity coming into it. And it's done a number of things, uh, certainly from a capacity standpoint uh, that, that has increased, but it's also um, the, there's more transparency in capacity now. So, um, you have, you know, panels of reinsurers now with relationships with, with, uh, with hybrid companies, fronting companies and relationships with, uh, with, uh, with MGAs. So there's just, there's just a lot more fluidity. Uh, and from our perspective, it's, um, we see nothing but positives in that trend. And I think it will continue. Um, you know, there, there's certainly been a, uh, uh, I think there'll be somewhat of a calling out of some of these carriers who went aggressively into the program space, maybe bit off a little more than they could chew. Um, there'll be some of that, uh, but uh, uh, I think you'll, you're going to continue to see kind of that model going forward and a movement towards capacity providers, providing regulatory support, et cetera, and then partnering with third parties that really provide the expertise, and I'm not just talking about underwriting. It's underwriting and distribution and, and uh, data management. We have a staff of actuaries at at Amenta um, that that we can provide value to our clients and our um, our program partners. Uh, so uh, so that's that's been a recent trend, and again, I think it's going to continue. We're going to see we're going to continue to see our business. Um, grow over the short and long term. Brad, one follow-up question. So I did lie. Um, you, you mentioned the, you know, the, 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 the shift or the, the growth in fronting companies and reinsurers. Um, why do you think is that access to capital didn't exist? Is that more awareness and the diversity of kind of risk diversification that's out there? Is there any, any reasoning behind that or is it just the reality of the current state versus the past? Yeah, I think, um, well, I think there's a, there's uh, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of capital out there for one, right? So there was, there was uh, capital looking at how can we get into the, into the insurance transaction business, but also they saw an opportunity to, um, to mirror up the back end to the front end. So the reinsurance capacity uh, to, uh, this growing program uh, marketplace. So um, again, you know, th there's just been a, a tremendous shift uh, over the past, you know, 10 to 15 years. Excellent, excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, Brad Isaacson, Brad, thank you so much. Um, you know, if there are potential prospective clients or, or programs looking to become part of the Aminta family, What's the best way for them to engage that going to the website, reaching out to you directly uh, or one of your, your colleagues? It, uh, the best way is to call me. Yeah. Okay. Brad Isaacson. So you'll, yeah. Uh, and you can find my contact information uh, on the website or certainly Mark, I'm sure you provide a link. So. Will do. Absolutely. 
But once again, Brad, thank you so much for your time. Truly appreciate it. Mark, thank you. Appreciate it. You've been listening to Beyond the Claim, a podcast for risk and claims leaders. To ensure you never miss an episode, please subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you use Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to give us a quick rating for the show. Just tap the number of stars that you think the podcast deserves. Until next time, stay curious and keep innovating.